this book was essentially born on the slopes of Denali. Um, I, I, uh, it was, it was there. That's where I've always gone to be with the earth is into the mountains. That's my favorite place. And it was there that I felt the pull to go to Iraq to report on what was happening there. And then later, back in the mountains again, it was there that I felt pulled to do this book. And um, I had moved up to Alaska in 1996, just the mountain climb. I'd been out of college about five or six years. Had, all I wanted to do was climb. I didn't care about anything else. So I got into mountaineering just so I could basically be up there. And um, it wasn't about conquering or anything like that. It was just about being up in that, that place on the earth. And um, I, don't, I didn't really know why I always felt pulled to the mountains. I'm from Houston, Texas. It didn't make a whole, but not a lot of big peaks in Houston, the Houston area. Um, but I, the first time I saw a mountain, it was like, that's, that I got to go there. And um, so I, uh, but then moving up to Alaska in 96, I was slapped in the face with the impacts of climate disruption already. Most people in this room probably already know the Arctic's warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet and has been. So things like going through Christmases in Anchorage with no snow on the ground, um, dramatically receding glaciers, you know, this was going on in the mid 90s, you know, at pace already, right when I moved up there and just was accelerating when I was up there. So I uh, dove in and uh, uh, went to Iraq, and then that led me to the BP oil spill after that, and then into full on climate change stories starting in late 2010. So I've been covering it for almost 10 years. Around 2013, I did a piece for Tom Englehart's website, tomdispatch.com, called Are We Already Off the Climate Precipice? And it was the first piece where I really connected all the dots of here's what's happening in the permafrost, here's what's happening with acidifying oceans, here's what's happening with losing ice, sea level rise, um, CO2 ppm in the atmosphere. Connect all the dots, interviewed a bunch of scientists and really got the memo we're off the cliff. We're, we're, we've, kicked, we've, we've baked enough heat into the system already that no matter what we do, we're in it. We're going into this now. And um, we're in it and we're going in deeper. And uh, my response at the time was several months of depression, <laughs> literally fetal position at times, fight or flight kicking in, but not going to leave the planet. So, you know, I, I start, that started my process of grief and um, what am I going to do about this? And the book, uh, a few years later, uh, a couple of years later, the idea for the book came to me again from spending time in the mountains. And I realized, yeah, I, I need to go write this book. And so I believe that the fundamental, dis the fundamental cause of climate disruption is our hum humanity's overall disconnection from nature that if we had been living closer to the earth as indigenous populations always have, that uh, I'd, like to think, I'd like to think that this, we wouldn't be in this predicament today. Um, and so I felt one thing I could do, kind of like I went to Iraq to, to um, humanize the Iraqi people and bring that information back here. Uh, I felt like I could go to some of these frontline places where the changes are happening the most dramatically and fastest and the most obvious and, and really try to give people a visceral feeling or, or experience of what it's like to go to those places. So I sought out scientists in different places from the Amazon to South Florida for sea level rise to uh, Craig Allen here in town. I did a whole chapter on trees to Sequoia National Park to Glacier National Park back to Denali up to Barrow which is now called Utkiagvik, the native name in Alaska, to St. Paul Island and the Pribilofs, um, and a lot of other places to try to bring people and show people, here, here's what's going on on the planet, and here's how fast things are really going. And so the book, it's funny, I came into it with, uh, I write these climate disruption dispatches for Truth Out, where I work as a staff reporter. And these dispatches started out out of a lot of anger and panic. And 
if you read, it's essentially, I, I, I collate the most recent scientific studies about what's happening. I, I break it up into the elements, earth, air, water, fire, and put it all in one place. And it's basically 2,500 words of apocalypse once a month. <laughs> and it's just the last 30 days. You know, here's records set, you know, this extreme event, uh, climate event, here's the latest, latest studies, et cetera. And for a long time, it was like, I'm going like, to beat people awake, whatever it takes. This is what we're going to do. And so I came into this book thinking it was going to be like 75% that, and climate dispatch, and then 25%, okay, like some personal writing, some nature writing. But when I started doing the book, it flipped. Like, you know, you know when you start doing art, it has a mind of its own, and and uh, it wasn't me. I, I believe today it was it was Gaia working through the book that the book basically flipped it. And the deeper into the book uh, I got, the the bigger that flip occurred to where there's obviously tons of science in the book. I went out into the field with scientists. There's dozens of pages of footnotes. Um, it's it's airtight factually, but it's it's really my own process of going out into the field and having my heart broken over and over again, seeing what's happening, and then also falling that much more in love with this planet, getting to go to these places that are incredible. Um, so I'm like I did at the event last week, I'm going to take folks to a couple of different areas and talk about a couple of these impacts that are happening and then um, take it from there. So. Uh, Obviously, I, you know, people have asked me, why ice? You, know, you could say the end of coral. You could say the end of the sequoia. You could say you know, all these things that I cover in the book. But uh, being a mountain guy, I have a thing for ice and glaciers. So it's basically my personal bias. Um, um, but also, it's, uh, well, I'll talk about some of these impacts now. So the first place that I want to take you, I mean, I, I went out um, on glaciers in a couple different places in Alaska with uh, US Geological Survey scientists. But then I also went, um, to keep it closer to home here, to Glacier National Park. Uh, um, how many folks here have been to Glacier National Park? All right, yeah, good. Before it's gone. Before it's gone. So I went out there and I met with a guy named Dr. Dan Fagri. He's a USGS research ecologist and he directs the Climate Change and Mountain Ecosystems Project. And he's also the lead investigator of the USGS Benchmark Glacier Program. And he's been working in the park there since 1991. I also intentionally chose scientists who had long-term intimate relationships with the areas where they were studying. So he's been there since 1991. And he's this guy that really very amiable, friendly guy, passionate about what he does, was very excited to meet with me and talk with me. And so um, we... So the USGS Benchmark Glacier Program, it's important to just underscore that because this is a, over a 50-year-old program where they have certain glaciers that representative of the regions where they are, Alaska, North Cascades, Glacier National Park, et cetera, and they do mass balance surveys every year, maximum minimum mass balance surveys. So it's a, a very, very old and extremely accurate scientific tracking of what's happening with ice uh, on glaciers in the United States, including Alaska. And, and so he is the, the lead investigator for that program. So I just want to underscore that. So we, uh, I met up with him, and uh, I want to just read a little bit here from when we went out into the field that day. Um, I met him at his office. He's in West Glacier National Park, right at the entrance there. And um, we uh, um, went out into the field we, together. And so we started talking about what, what he was seeing. And he says, this is an explosion, a nuclear explosion of geologic change, Descri as he describes the impact of climate disruption while we look out across a valley together. This is unusual. It is incredibly rapid and exceeds the ability for normal adaptation. We've shoved it into overdrive and taken our hands off the wheel. He, uh, at this point, we're on top, we're up at Logan Pass, you drive up this stunning going into the Sun Highway, and it's this pass, so we're, you know, really good view of a lot of the park, and it's a very, very hot day. He takes me to stand in another area up there, which was 
basically just slush. The people who built the Logan Pass Road had to deal L Logan Pass Road had to deal with a glacier here, right here. He says, pointing down to our feet. Now there is no glacier. To underscore his point, Fagri tells me that this year they had 137 percent of their normal snowpack, and two days earlier it was already below normal for this time of year because of the heat. I met with him in July. We had a snowfall up here recently that needed to be plowed, he says, smiling, and it melted before they could plow it. I ask him if that kind of thing is what keeps him up at night. He tells me that these are nonlinear changes that aren't based on a simple proportional relationship between cause and effect. They are usually abrupt, unexpected, and challenging to predict. Quote, the aggregate of multiple nonlinear changes is enormous in orders of magnitude, and that's what keeps Dan Fagri worried at nights, he says. After a pause to let all that sink in, he goes on to explain that the Earth has a resilient system that has been through much worse than what we've caused, ice ages, volcanism, etc. So many of these things will recover, he says, of the glaciers and forests that are vanishing before our eyes, but not in a time frame that includes humans. We return to the car and continue driving down the other side of the pass. We roll down our windows and neither one of us talks for a while. I know it's a sensitive topic to bring up with scientists and most of them avoid it at all cost, but I decide to ask him what it's like for him personally to watch the glaciers vanish before his eyes. It's like being a battle-hardened soldier, he says, but on a philosophical basis, it's tough to watch the thing you study disappear. I watch him drive for a couple of silent moments, then I look out across the valley and listen to the waterfalls as they stream down toward the river far below us. <clears throat> um, we, uh, so he went on to tell me, and he made international headlines that summer, speaking about this to the international press as well, that at current trajectory, assuming things don't speed up, which of course we all know things are speeding up every day now, that Glacier National Park will no longer have glaciers by 2030. So that's in less than 11 years now. And what he means by that, there will still be patches of ice uh, on north slopes at bases of peaks that get covered with avalanche debris that keeps that ice there. But there's different definitions of what constitutes a glacier depending on which region you're in. So A, it has to move, and B, it has to cover a certain square kilometer area. And so by those definitions, there will be no glaciers there by 2030. Uh, he has said, and there's scientific studies to back this, there will be no glaciers anywhere in the contiguous 48 states by 2100. Uh, there will be almost no glaciers in the Himalaya by 2100. So thinking about what this means, ecologically, I'll start there. And this is all in the book, and it was fascinating to me because I, I hadn't understood this. But ecologically speaking, um, you don't just lose this beautiful body of ice that's very aesthetic, that if a glacier's in a valley, it serves really important functions. Um, as, as he explained using Glacier National Park as an example, uh, it's going to keep, obviously the streams running out of it are quite cold. So there's bull trout there, which are called the polar bear of trout. Uh, and then there's certain insects that are only going to exist in this temperature range. So the animals and birds that eats those, eat those fish and insects, if that glacier goes away, that stream goes away, and those are all going to go away the groundwater that it supports, and the vegetation dependent upon that, trees, shrubs, etc., and everything that lives there, all that's going to go away if you take the glaciers away. And then, of course, glaciers and snowpack, the, he refers to the mountains as water towers, that they're this kind of self-regulating system that releases water under normal conditions right when we need it, and then holds it and builds it back up through the winters. So as we crank up the temperatures, all that gets changed and it starts going away rapidly. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, human impacts, it's pretty obvious, but I'll cover it. Um, I, I live up in the Pacific Northwest on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. 2015, 
Jay Inslee, our governor, we had, we're, he declared statewide drought by May 15 in 2015. The Olympics had 6% of their snowpack that year. In Rainier and the North Cascades, they were a little better off, but not much. So we were water rationing in Port Townsend. Farmers were losing crops, uh, and this was in 2015. So you can imagine and think about it when this snowpack goes away or keeps diminishing, what does that do to your agriculture? What does that do to your water, et cetera? Uh, on a bigger scale, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, uh, where one of the biggest ice fields on the planet is and several, obviously, loads and loads of glaciers. And it's also the location of seven of Asia's biggest water drainage systems. It provides drinking water and irrigation for 1.5 billion people. Mm -hmm. And a report came out right around the time my book was released in January that showed at current trajectory by 2100, all or most of that ice will be gone. So 1.5 billion people don't have water to drink and don't have uh, irrigation for their crops. So where are they going to go? And then what happens to the regions where they go? Is there going to be enough water? You see where this is going. And we're talking 2100. This is not long from now. So a kid born today, you know, is, is going to see this, is going to live through this. And this is, this is baked into the system now. This is what's happening. Um, the next place that I'd like to, oh, one, one last thing on that, Antarctica. Um, a, a study was published. It was the lead author was Dr. Eric Rigno, UC Irvine published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It, was, it came out literally a day or two my, before my book was published. It was kind of crazy timing. In that study, he's one of the leading Antarctic glacial scientists out there. And that study showed that just since the 1970s, melting across Antarctica has increased sixfold. And he was, he was interviewed by the New York Times in the wake of that. And literally said, quote, Antarctica is melting away. So we're, we're talking about this then dovetails into the next topic I'd like to cover, which is sea level rise. So for sea level rise, uh, I went down to South Florida, very obvious place. I imagine most of you are aware of what's going on down there with sea level rise, but it's also where some of the leading experts on the planet studying this are located. So, um, I first met with uh, Ben Kurtman. He is with University of Miami. He is also an IPCC author. IPCC is the International Panel on Climate Change. And uh, um, he, he, he informed me about you know, the causes of you know, the leading contributor to sea level rise, obviously, is melting ice, particularly land-based ice. Uh, another one is thermal expansions of the oceans as water warms. It's basic physics. It expands, so it takes up more space. Uh, and then current changes and then uh, wind changes. And so that makes all those four things are active. The impacts of them are active and at their most intense, literally right where Miami Beach is. So um, um, it's another reason why these guys are there studying it, uh, men and women, sorry. And so he, he talked to me about worst case IPCC projections of sea level rise, which is around um, three to four feet, I believe, by 2100. Uh, and um, um, he was pretty middle of the road about it. When I was there talking with them, he said, well, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency just uh, 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 increased their worst case predictions from like eight feet to eight and a half feet by 2100. Um, and, and then uh, after Ben Kurtman, I went and met with his colleague, Dr. Harold Wanless at University of Miami Coral Gables, a different campus. Wanless is professor and chair of the University of Miami Department of Geological Science. BA in Geology from Princeton, MS in Marine Geology from University of Miami, PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Johns Hopkins. Uh, so he's extremely well positioned to provide a holistic view of climate disruption and sea level rise. And um, I'd like to read a short bit out of here about a conversation I met with him. The great thing about Wanless is, you know, anyone that's an active IPCC 
author is very constrained, and I'll get into this a little bit later, about how they talk about things and what they really think about that. Uh, Wanless, uh, he's an older fella, and he's tenured, and he just doesn't give a damn about funding or what people think or, or whether or not he's going to get published. All you need to do is look at his resume and his body of work. He just doesn't give a shit. He's just like, I'm going to tell it like it is. And he had great, great uh, respect for Kurtman. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, I'll just read this. So now in his 70s, Wanless has been tracking sea levels throughout his storied career. We sit down in his office at a table covered in books and folders. I notice photos of a trip to the Greenland ice sheet on the wall. I began to tell him that I had just met with Kurtman and Bruce Mowry, the city engineer of Miami Beach, some of you have probably seen him. Uh, Nat, Nat Geo did a doc, documentary there where they were actively raising the seats in parts of the city three feet to buy them time. Um, that's a whole nother can of worms for another conversation. Um, and I'd learned about Kurtman and Mowry's perspectives on sea level rise, and Wanless just cut me off. He says, we've screwed ourselves. We kicked the bucket. We've gone off the cliff. 93.4% of the global warming heat we've produced is in the oceans. And half of that went in since just 1997. That is unbelievable. If we'd only gotten hold of this when we knew about it in the 80s, we'd have less than half the problems we have now. Wanless, who has been watching things go from bad to worse for so long, is taken aback by the business-as-usual mindset of the general public. We have to stop doing this, he continues, with population increasing, with industrialization ongoing, and with the sad exuberance about opening the Arctic as an opportunity to get more oil and gas, shouldn't we be thinking, oh my God, what have we done? We continued uh, to talk. Um, he went on to talk about uh, at length, the Greenland ice sheet and the Western Antarctic ice sheet, which right now are the two leading contributors to sea level rise. And uh, that he, he personally said he couldn't see us seeing probably anything less than 10 feet sea level rise by 2100, and cited a report, a peer-reviewed study published by James Hansen, uh, formerly NASA a scientist, uh, saying we could see 10 feet by 2050. So he, we talked about, for example, how Turkey Point Nuclear Plant, which is just south of Miami, six feet elevation, uh, two reactors there. Uh, they just started building a third. <laughs> Wanless is pissed off. Uh, he said things like, you know, Miami's, the entire water supply for Miami is this very thin lens of fresh water, not very far underground. It's not a matter of if, but when that starts getting contaminated by encroaching seas. Uh, if you go to Miami and Miami Beach, there's a thing, they call it sunny day flooding. Uh, high tides, it hasn't rained for weeks, sun's out, people are just putting on their galoshes and walking through the streets when it's the ocean coming in because it's high tide. Um, it's already happening, so it's an amazing thing. And when I was there, Rick Scott was still governor. He's now senator. This is the guy who, when he was governor, forbade uh, state employees from using the words climate change or global warming. Um, and, and Wanless was incensed. He was incensed at these politicians. He called them criminally negligent, especially those that actually knew what was happening. And he singled out Marco Rubio. He says, I know for a fact he knows and he's doing the bidding of his financiers anyway. And he said, because what really should be happening is a government mandated and funded and orchestrated mass relocation of South Florida. We're talking about millions of people, we're talking about nuclear plants, we're talking about remediating toxic waste sites, moving archives, art galleries, museums, etc. All that has to be moved for higher ground. And he said, we can either start doing it now in an orderly way, or we cannot do anything and just wait for the chaos. Because once that real estate bubble pops, this trillion dollar plus real estate bubble around South Florida, and they're building houses and condos and high rises like nobody's business as we speak. Once that pops, there it goes. And even Bloomberg has reported 
that it, that pop will happen before the first bit of water comes into the first house. It could happen literally at any moment now. So um, we talked about that, and then I want to, um, rather than read, I'll just share with you. So he said, look, we, the earth has, uh, when we came out of the last ice age, and CO, you know, things uh, unfroze and CO2 started coming out of more land and plants and, and back into the atmosphere, um, uh, the land and the soil, I mean. Um, we, we, it increased, it added 100 parts per million CO2 to the atmosphere. And corresponding with that was 100 feet of sea level rise because as that, that the warming that that brought about. And he, he said, so I said, um, you know, well, we, I thought about it. Well, we were at 280 ppm before the Industrial Revolution began. We're now, we're actually now at 412. We were at 410 when I was speaking with them. And I said, so that's 130 ppm. So that's 130 feet of sea level rise. And he just nodded. Um, Um, so my point, which I said up front, is it's already far too late to avert global climate catastrophe. We're in it. We have a lot of the current science shows us that if we stopped all CO2 emissions on a dime right now, Globally, we have probably 3C increase baked into the system. We're at about 1.1 right now. 3C is catastrophic, and that's best case scenario. 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded. The only warmer years were 2015, 2016, and 2017. We're currently in the middle of what is on track easily to be the warmest decade since record keeping began. So expect more record years as we keep going forward. We're already in the sixth mass extinction event. There's peer reviewed studies that show this Paul Ehrlich study I, I cite specifically, uh, which industrial civilization caused. We're injecting CO2 in the atmosphere at a rate 10 times faster than what occurred during the Permian mass extinction event which is the single uh, most intense extinction event in the history of the planet. It happened 252 million years ago and annihilated 90% of life on Earth. Our current extinction rate is a thousand times faster than a normal background extinction rate and is already faster than that of the Permian mass extinction. Uh, but it's really hard to take in these truths and what they mean, and, and already this is enough information to just take it in and think about it and think about what it really means. Um, and, and the way I see it is there's different reactions to this. And uh, there's, on the, on the right end of the political spectrum, there's denialism. And I look at this when I'm in a more compassionate place as the compassion stage of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross five stages of grief, that you know this is so overwhelming and scary and grief producing to look at this information about what's happening to the planet that uh, it, it, I understand that some people just want it, no, it's not happening, climate disruption is not real, blah, blah, blah. But there's also a type of denialism on the left. And so, for example, the hoopla that came out last fall around the IPCC report that came out that said, we have 12 years left to avert catastrophic climate disruption. Nonsense. 12 years. There was not one new piece of data in this report. They're using all IPCC data. Everyone, including IPCC authors that I interviewed for this book, said, this data is lowest common denominator. It's not true science. It's consensus science. There's a very strong political element to it. And, and, and at best, that data, when these assessments come out, is at a minimum 10 years old. IPCC projections from the beginning, if you look back historically, and if you look at their future projections of what they project to happen each year, 
observational reality consistently outpaces their worst case predictions. Got it? So there's that, but we hold the IPCC to this gold standard. Governments around the world use them to make preparations. Well, not ours, but other governments around the, some governments use them. So that's a form of denial. The New Green Deal, you know, in 10 years we can transform our economy. This, this idea that we can keep maintaining this kind of lifestyle, that's a form of denialism. You know, other things like, you know, geoengineering, which is insanity. Uh, Harvard, you can go to their website of the school right now, they have a geoengineering study department now. So this is coming. Brace yourself for this. And geoengineering is total insanity. Um, and then other forms of denialism, uh, you know, there's lots of other examples even across the left. And none of these, I argue, take into account the fact that we're already off the cliff. Every single one of these is an attempt to fix th something that's not fixable. And the thing I keep coming back to on that is what's already baked into the system. And as Dr. Wanless says, whenever anybody brings up this, we can fix it, we can mitigate it, he says, how do you get that heat out of the oceans? Because that's enough heat in the oceans that if, if the oceans hadn't absorbed it, our, our atmospheric temperature today would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. We'd be well on our way to Venus. Um, today's carbon dioxide levels at 412 parts per million are already in accordance with what historically, we're talking about geologic history, had brought about a steady state temperature globally 7C higher. We're just, we've already done the injury to the earth. We're just waiting for the earth to catch up. We're waiting for the rest of the ice to melt. We're waiting for the oceans to warm up. We're waiting for more species to go extinct. The oceans are now literally overheating, deoxygenating, and acidifying. Insects, which are, an are essential for the proper function of all of our ecosystems, as they are food for other creatures, pollinators, and recyclers of nutrients, are going away. Uh, most people in this room are probably familiar with several reports that have come out recently, the most damning of which said, we're right now on a trajectory, we're losing 2.4 of the global insect population per year. And if that continues, assuming it doesn't accelerate, no more insects by 2100, but within 100 years, within 100 years. No more insects, no more food chain, no more humans. And that's because of climate disruption and habitat loss and pesticides. Uh, since just 1970, 60% of all mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles are gone. And as I said the other night, what would we call it if there had been a 60% reduction in the human species since just 1970? So the IPCC's worst case temperature scenario is 4 to 5 C by 2100. The International Energy Agency stated that preserving our current economic paradigm virtually guarantees a 6 C rise in Earth's average temperature before 2050. Shell and BP analysts expect the globe to reach as much as 5 C warmer also by 2050. So the piece that I wrote, that I cited earlier for Tom Englehart in 2013, uh, it's clear now six years later after a sober reading of all the latest climate science indicates we're now genuinely in free fall. We're clearly in a nonlinear situation of climatic disruptions and their effects across the planet. And we're locked into a course of uncontrollable levels of climate disruption, bringing starvation, destruction, mass migration, disease, and war globally. And there can no longer be any question that life as we know it is ending. So what do we do with all of this? And, you know, looking at the possibility of even the extinction of humans, let alone all the other species that I, I've been citing statistics for. And I, I got to a point um, at the end of this book, I got right up to the concluding chapter and was basically like, how the F do I end this book? You know, I have no idea and I, I had this this ending written 
And um, I felt like I had genuinely done a service for the earth in writing this book and the support came and I was carried all the way through it. And I feel like that was coming directly from the earth because I was serving her. And um, it also brought into my life uh, a Cherokee elder medicine man named Stan Rushworth. And he teaches down at a little community, Cabrillo College in Aptos, California. And um, I met him at a gathering last June. And he brought in a lot of important information for me that ended up completely changing the, end of the ending of this book. And one of them was that he reminded me of uh, really a, dis a very important distinction between the settler colonialist mindset of that we have rights, what are my rights, versus the indigenous perspective of we're born into this world with obligations, an obligation to serve and take care of and be a steward of the earth, and an obligation to make mindful decisions to take care of the future generations of humans and all species. And so if I, if I try that on and I start looking at, at making my decisions through that lens of when I get up each day, what's my job, what are the work, what's the work I'm going to do, am I looking at it through a lens of in what way is this best going to serve the earth and future generations? Or am I looking at it through a lens of you know, it's my right to do this, or how much money can I make, or, or this kind of thing. Like, what are, what are my reasons? And I feel like there's a really important moment in history where we each get to ask ourselves these questions and start, if we're not already doing that, and, and a lot of people here probably are, but if we're not already doing that, start making our decisions based from that place. Um, I had to address hope in the book. Because uh, a lot of people are like, wow, well, this is just completely hopeless. And I, I address how hope versus hopelessness is a false choice. Um, I, I think we're way beyond hope. I feel like if we engage in hope, we give our agency away. We give our agency away to an activist telling us what to do, a politician. And it's also future-based. And it takes us out of the present tense. And right here, right now is where all my agency is. Um, I have a quote. Uh, from Vaclav Havel, Czech dissident writer and statesman, who said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. And I think that that is now my new operating system. Because if I get engaged in hope and I get in attached to the results of my actions or what our actions are, I'm going to hang it up. And I'm going to quit. And I've, I've felt like quitting. And I've taken weeks where I haven't done anything because I've been in that place. But it comes down to that moral obligation. And as Stan put it, how am I going to choose to comport myself during this time? Because if we are indeed going out as a species, and it looks like we are, but we don't know. And if we've never been here, and we don't know what's going to happen, and no matter what, we are obliged to serve the planet and to serve future generations. And that means that we are obliged to do absolutely everything in our power to try to make things better, even just a little bit. And so, um, you know, I, I don't try to tell people what to do. I feel like this answer has to come from deep inside. And Stan shared a story with me where he would bring, he's brought various elders into his class, indigenous elders, and they've given these deep talks and for three hours. And then at the end of them, the students ask them all these questions. What do we do? What do we do about what's happened to indigenous people? You know, we wiped out 96%, we being colonial settler culture, wiped out 96% of their population nationally. Um, and they talk about all these other issues, and so they're confronted with, well, what do we do? And he said several of them all just would do this. And they'd sit there for a minute, and they'd say, you have to think. You have to think about what you're going to do. Because if I tell you what to do, when things get really, really hard, as they will, you're going to lose the gumption to follow through. But if it comes from in here, you're not going to, because you're going to know what to do, and you're following your own heart. And so um, Stan's elder, Daryl Wilson, he's from the Pitt River Nation in Northeast California. 
he shared with me uh, a story about um, that I'm, I'm going to read it, I think, and in order to uh, come into my conclusion here before we go into a QA, and uh, a because I like to quote it directly. Um, Wilson tells a story of Mis Misa, a small but powerful spirit that inhabits Akuyet, which is their, their name for Mount Shasta. Mis Misa is a spirit force that balances the earth with the universe and the universe with the earth. Wilson says that Akuyet is, quote, the most necessary of all of the mountains upon earth, for Mis Misa keeps the earth the proper distance from the sun and keeps everything in its proper place when wonder and power stir the universe with a giant yet invisible canoe paddle. Mis Misa keeps the earth from wandering away from the rest of the universe. It maintains the proper seasons and the proper atmosphere for life to flourish as earth changes seasons on its journey around the sun. The mountain, the story tells us, must be worshipped because Mis Misa dwells deep within it. To climb the mountain with a pure heart and with real resolve and to communicate with, quote, all of the light and all of the darkness of the universe is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa. So, uh, I'm sorry, is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa to the heart of the universe. While in this posture, the spirit of man slash woman is in perfect balance and harmony. For as long as Mis Misa's instructions are followed with sincerity, society will be sustained. Its inhabitants will survive for the long term. Quote, the most important of all the lessons, Wilson said, it is said, is to be so quiet in your being that you constantly hear the soft singing of Mis Misa. However, the story also warns that by not listening to Mis Misa's song, the song will fade. Mis Misa will depart. Quote, and the earth and all of the societies upon earth will be out of balance and the life therein vulnerable to extinction. And so, for me, I always wondered why I was drawn up into the mountains, this Texas boy from Houston. Uh, why have I always gone there? Why have I done these crazy trips on a lot of high mountains and had near-death experiences? Like, and then all of a sudden, when Stan shared this story with me in June, I, I got it. It's like, that's where I go to listen. And that's where I've heard these pulls to go to Iraq, and that's where I heard the pull to do this book. Because going to Iraq, I had to push through a lot of stuff, but I stayed with it because it came from here, which came from here. And the same thing with working on the book. It came, it came from here, and it came from here. And I feel like we're at a moment in history where things are intense, and they're get, about to get a whole lot more intense globally. And I feel like we're each in a position where we need to find a, a lot deeper place to get our direction and our resolve about what to do at this, at this moment. So I like to conclude these talks with just sending you home with homework, which is two questions to contemplate. And one is, where do you go to listen to Mis Misa? And the other is, when was the last time that you went there? Thanks, everybody.